Thanks for coming and good job to all the panelists 10 minutes ago. All right, so my name is Sarah Thompson. I hail from Sports Info Solutions, and today I'm going to be talking about evaluation of minor league defense using detailed contextual data. And by the end of this presentation, I hope you'll have a better understanding of what recent innovations SIS has made in the realm of minor league defense and what we can learn from evaluating defense with detailed contextual data. All right, here we go. So yeah, purpose of this talk today, um, I'm going to reintroduce minor league defensive run saved. It's already been a thing, but we're going to talk about it again. Uh, we're going to talk about how we just implemented the part system in the outfield. And I'm going to illustrate the part system with some examples. And then finally, I'm going to explain some differentials between minor league and major league player defensive abilities. So let's go over a brief history of minor league defensive evaluation. Prior to 2017, basically what we had was scouting grades and maybe some more in-depth scouting reports, but you know, your 20 to 80 scale pretty much, uh, you might hear a guy as a plus or a plus plus glove, what have you. Um, but then in 2017, uh, SIS ventured to construct an objective metric or at least as close as we can get to objective uh, with human collected data. Uh, with defensive runs saved. And while that was introduced many years prior at the major league level, uh, we didn't introduce it at the minor league level until 2017. And the backbone of that version of defensive runs saved was the plus minus system. Um, and what's important about that is that that was before we had positioning data and we kind of wrapped positioning and range ability into a single number. But then in 2018, we introduced PART, the PART system, and we only introduced that for infielders, but the difference between the PART and plus minus system is that under PART, we can actually separate a player's positioning ability from their range ability. And as an aside, um, minor league DRS at the moment is like proprietary and exclusive to our team clients, but we will get a taste of it here today. Uh, but why do we care? Uh, many reasons. Uh, player development's a big, a big lens to look through. So it's a good way to identify areas of improvement using minor league DRS. Um, you know, is your fielder bad at fielding ground balls or is he just bad at fielding ground balls hit over a hundred miles an hour, five feet to his right. So in a PD use case, uh, an objective or close to objective measure of defense can lead to more efficient efforts towards improvement. From a player evaluation standpoint, um, let's say you're a GM of a team or president of baseball ops, and you're calling up a replacement player after all your major league center fielders were injured, and you know the bat will probably flounder at the major league level anyway. So you might, in that situation, choose to prioritize defensive ability. Um, so an objective major league centered stat like DRS uh, could help better inform those decisions. You know, it's just another tool in the tool bag. Finally, projection. Uh, minor league DRS is built with comparison to major leaguers in mind. So for that reason, we interpret minor league DRS the same way we do as major league DRS, which if you don't know, uh, zero runs saved at a position is like average ability for that kind of fielder. So what's new for minor league DRS? Uh, in 2013, we started collecting fielder positioning data for infielders. That's decidedly not new, uh, but we just started collecting fielder positioning data for outfielders and the minors in 2021. Um, and what's important about that is that that's super available at the major league level. We see it all the time, um, but not so much at the minor league level, although I hear Hawkeye is coming to some AAA parks, so that's good. But um, how that works is we have human charters collecting data off broadcast video. Um, which can run into some quality issues, but what we do is we only chart a fielder's position if we're really confident about the quality of that data point. And basically what we do with this new positioning data is we can finally split positioning from range for outfielders. So how have we enhanced defensive evaluation in recent years? As I said, uh, I alluded to the part system for infielders that we introduced to minor league DRS in 2018, but now that we have outfielder positioning data, we can introduce it to the outfield and the minor leagues as well. Uh, part, if you don't know, stands for positioning, air, range, and throwing. 
But for the outfield, only positioning and range uh, are really applicable. The air component is referring to infield air balls. So most balls in the outfield are in the air. So we it's just range and positioning. And also throws are already handled under DRS from the outfield. That's been a thing forever. So it's really just positioning and range for the outfield. And the table on the right can kind of be a quick reference if you forget. Um, what else about part? Part is an improvement over the pre-existing plus minus system. Both uh, components are really the core component of DRS. There are many components of DRS, but they're really the core of it. Um, and again, as I said, plus minus, we wrapped range and positioning into a single number, but with part, we split it out, which we can't do without fielder coordinates. Uh, we can't really figure out if a guy's ranging or not if we don't know where he was standing in relation to the ball. So as I teased earlier, I'll finally explain to you the plus minus system, the part system and their differences. So under both systems, we credit a fielder based on his probability of making an out. Uh, if a fielder makes an out on a 75% out rate play, he only gets 0.25 plays saved credit. Uh, that's like one minus the out rate, right? So if he misses the play, he gets minus 0.75 play saved credit. It's pretty simple. Uh, many things work this way. Uh, it's a pretty common methodology. Um, by the way, this probability of making an out is based on major league out rates, even when we're talking about minor league fielders. Um, and this has some really interesting consequences that we'll kind of get into later. Uh, but where these systems differ is how we determine the probability of making an out, right? So under plus minus, as I said, we don't have fielder coordinates. Uh, we can only assume that balls of similar characteristics have similar out rates. And, you know, that can be true a lot of the time, but fielder position is super important. So under part, the parameters for determining out rate are instead batted ball hang time, distance to travel, and approach angle. And I should note that these, like, the distance and the approach angle, that's like as the crow flies, or rather like the fielder's direct path to the ball. So if he broke the wrong way initially and then broke the right way, we don't really know that that happened. Uh, but that's okay, because he should probably be penalized for breaking the wrong way in the first place. So we're going to go through a couple of video examples that kind of highlight how uh, Part and plus minus will treat these plays differently and how part is certainly an improvement in these specific cases. Uh, so one second. So hope you guys could see that okay. On this play, we have like a line drive hit to deepish left field. Uh, we saw that the left fielder was positioned nearly perfectly. He really hardly had to move on that play. Um, however, the plus minus system, that's old news now, treats this play very differently than the part system. Oops. All right, so yeah, under plus minus, uh, like that kind of ball, which is hit at under two and a half seconds of hang time, hit 280 feet at that certain spray angle, basically all those characteristics yield a low uh, out probability. And since he caught that ball, that fielder gets uh, a large amount of range credit, right? But part, as we'll see, kind of understands that he didn't really range out there. So part knows he... It's the same hang time, but he traveled less than 10 feet, went straight back. Uh, he really didn't have an opportunity to show his range on that play. So it's a good thing. So he makes that out, but he doesn't get a, a high amount of range credit. And this is just one example, but the flip side is important too. So if a fielder is positioned far from the ball and doesn't make the play, in general, he will be penalized less harshly under part than plus minus which we'll see here. Yeah, so that guy like had really hardly a chance of making a play on that ball. Um, I don't know if you could see, but at the very beginning, like right when the ball's hit, you can see he started shaded uh, way right and uh, in right center, but the ball's hit towards left center. So all that's to say he had to run a much greater distance to get to the ball than if he was positioned normally or like even semi-normally. 
So for that reason, plus minus penalizes the center fielder much more than part does because plus minus doesn't take into account a starting position. It just knows that most of the time uh, a center fielder will catch a ball hit at that depth, that angle and opportunity time. And these are pretty like extreme indifference, like probability plays between the two systems. But in general, the philosophy is pretty consistent. Like if a guy is positioned well, he'll get less range credit than he would under the old system. And if he's not positioned well, he'll probably be penalized less, uh, which is what we want. So let's look into some player studies. Uh, this is like the taste of the DRS numbers I hinted at earlier. Uh, we're going to look at Michael Harris the second first. So he's a center fielder, Braves organization. Uh, he looked pretty good defensively from like a fan standpoint watching on TV. But our DRS numbers liked him as well. Um, in 2021, he had five runs saved in the minors, uh, prorated on a thousand inning basis. That's 10. So he really only played 500 back then, but it's all good. Um, yeah, then following year in MLB, uh, six runs saved. Or rated to a thousand, still six, but yeah, basically this is a good example of a guy that minor league DRS liked him, major league DRS liked him, and the eye test also likes him. Um, and I should note that that five runs saved in the minors uh, led center fielders that year. So it's a pretty small number, but among minor leaguers, that's a really good rate. All right, Jaron Duran, um, kind of the opposite, like DRS doesn't love him neither in the minors nor the majors. Um, he had negative six in 2021 in minors and then negative six in 2022 in the majors. Um, for a thousand inning basis, that's negative 14. So it kind of looks like he was probably about 500-ish innings again in both years. But uh, nothing exciting there. I will say though that like, as a minor leaguer, like negative six runs below a major league average isn't that bad. Ma minor league DRS skews very negative. So it's really like not the worst out of the bunch in the minors. Uh, Christian Pache. So he's our last player study. And here's someone who by DRS standards uh, looked like a poor fielder for a stint in the minors in 2021 and looked good for a stint in the majors in 2022. And I say defensive run save standards because as far as I've looked into uh, reports on Pache's defense has been overwhelmingly positive even before reaching the majors and our major league DRS numbers do support that notion. Um, but an 11 run save difference here is pretty stark. We went from negative five to six. So I dug into it and there's multiple factors at play here. There always is. Um, but one thing in particular stuck out and it was on plays with like a 56 to 65% predicted out rate in the minors. He did pretty bad on those. He only caught three out of 11 and in the major league level, he caught like eight of nine. And I mean, you can see from those numbers, I just spat out that we're dealing with some pretty small samples. Um, but that just like play group alone explains a pretty decent chunk of that gap. And that fact provides a nice segue into the next topic. Uh, how much difference in defensive ability are minor leaguers from major leaguers? So I mentioned that DRS for minor leaguers compares minor leaguers to a major league basis. And a result of that is that most minor leaguers fall below zero in DRS. And most players with run save totals uh, greater than zero aren't much above zero. So at least by DRS, most minor leaguers don't seem to exhibit as good range as major leaguers. Uh, but, you know, I want to look under the hood and stuff. So we can look into this in two different ways. Uh, one thing we can do is group plays by MLB play difficulty and observe how often minor leaguers catch those balls. Another thing we can do is look into which kinds of batted balls are caught less often uh, at the minor league level than the major league. So in this table, we're comparing play difficulties between Minor and major league players in 2022, uh, the outrate group on the left-hand side, those are like the predicted outrates uh, determined by the process I described earlier. And again, those are based off major league players. Uh, the middle column is how often the plays in that predicted outrate range were actually caught by minor leaguers. And then the far right column is the analogous number for major leaguers. So we look at the first group, uh, 96 to 100% play difficulties, uh, really routine balls. Uh, we see minor leaguers fall right in the middle of that band at 98%. Um, so we can infer that 
at least among incredibly easy plays, there's hardly a gap uh, in ability between minor and major leaguers, which seems to follow intuition pretty well. You know, routine as a professional should truly be routine. So, but if we look at the 86 to 95% group, uh, we see that the minor league out rate has already dipped outside that group down to 85%. And major leaguers uh, make those plays on the whole about 92% of the time. And basically this trend uh, kind of follows as the lower you go. So if we look at the 56 to 65% outright group, um, you have plays that are more than likely to be caught in major leagues and they're suddenly less than likely to be caught uh, in minor leagues. And at almost a 20% difference rate, uh, that's pretty significant. And I didn't list uh, every outright group because that would get long, uh, but the trend really, it just keeps following down. Like the harder the plays get, the bigger the disparity in minor league and major league success rates on those balls. Uh, so we talked about how there's some relationship between play difficulty in MLB and lower out rates in minor league baseball, but you may be wondering what kinds of plays make up those disparate groups. So I can't go over every like bucket, but here I've listed for each position, um, the groups with the largest outrate disparity between minor leagues and major league baseball. And it's kind of nice to see that these plays aren't really so different from each other. Um, they all feel their travel distance of like 90 feet ish with some decently large hang times. We can see for left fielders, uh, the plays with the biggest gap in out rate is when the fielder has to travel 90 feet, um, the ball's in the air for over five seconds and he's running straight back. And the major league out rate on those plays is 85% compared to a minor league out rate of 56%. That's a pretty big gap. For center fielders, uh, the biggest like disparate group is uh, when they have to travel 90 feet laterally on balls in the air from like 4.2 to five seconds. Uh, and that's an 80%, 87% major league out rate versus a 55% minor league out rate. And it's the same group for right fielders, except kind of intuitively, we see that both out rates are kind of lower than the center field out rate. So on those plays, right fielders in MLB make them 79% of the time versus 46% in minor league baseball. And uh, yeah, so like before kind of like digging into this, I expected like some disparities between minor league and major leaguers due to obviously experience, but I kind of figured like they're younger, they're sprier, so it might make up for a bit of it. But clearly, as we've seen in the past two slides, um, there's some pretty big gaps in defensive ability, at least by what DRS is telling us. So to recap, uh, now we have minor league outfield positioning data. With that data, we can split positioning credit from range like we do for infielders and have been doing. And with this, uh, we can garner better insights into defensive ability of minor league players. Uh, but there's work to be done, of course. This is just like V1. Um, so probably like the first and foremost thing to do is start to incorporate wall balls. Um, if you don't know, Wall balls, like proximity to the wall, basically has a pretty large influence on catchability. Um, there's a lot of published work on it, if you can Google it. But uh, we do this in DRS already in major leagues because um, wall distance data is really easy to get, but it's less easy to get at the minor league level. But we're working on it, and it's a pretty important factor, so that'll probably be the first thing we dig into. Um, also descriptive defense, uh, in addition to like the stuff I already talked about, our video scouts collect descriptive um, information on our fielders. So if they're diving, jumping, sliding, so that can certainly inform our rates if we want them to. Uh, last things to consider. I talked about how minor league DRS is set up on a major league basis, but maybe you actually just want to know how a minor leaguer relates to his peers. Um, that's certainly a worthy question. So something we could look into. It's probably not a big lift. Um, furthermore, advanced modeling techniques. Uh, what we do is like a bucketing system. So we basically just group balls of similar characteristics um, together and find matches. But, you know, even like, a multivariate linear regression wouldn't be a big lift to translate to, and it probably wouldn't lose a lot of explainability, but 
yeah, it'd be interesting to see like what more advanced statistical methods could yield. And the last thing I'll talk about is opportunity inequality. Um, I read something on fan graphs recently that was talking about a different outfield range statistic, but it could certainly apply to DRS as well, where like players with like high value of that uh, st defensive statistic also had like a certain amount of opportunities of a certain play difficulty and irrespective of whether they were making the outs on those plays, like it kind of inflated their value, their defensive value. So obviously like I was talking about like putting guys on a similar playing field on that other slide by per 1000 innings. But I mean, if there's really an opportunity and equality here that's influencing DRS numbers, um, we want to account for that. Acknowledgements. Um, Thanks to SIS Video Scouts, they work really hard to collect our data uh, and then we get DRS and then I get to talk about it up here. Um, John Dewan, founder of SIS and the namesake of a defensive analytics award. So obviously I still wouldn't be up here without him either. And then SIS Baseball R&D for all of their fabulous support. Thanks. Any questions? Man in the hat. So that's a really good question. Um, I should have I should have named the title better because most of the focus over the winter was in the outfield. Um, so I didn't actually go into that in the outfield and in the infield and investigate that, but that's probably something I want to do because I'd like to know that as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so if the if the out is not made, both players, if they had like a greater than zero probability of making it, will get dinged. But if the out is made, like the left fielder doesn't get rewarded for that. Um, I think there's a lot of things that play there. Um, I will say that like even I don't know if this totally answers your question, but even if we break down like minor league DRS by level, so I was looking at triple A versus double A versus one of the single A, um, even then we see like triple A players are generally better than double A players. So I think there is like, I don't know exactly what to account for as far as like differences in league ability, but I think there are differences there. Um, yeah, and the plan. Good question. Uh, no, it's just caught or not caught. And that is like, I think, an opportunity for improvement because a lot of the times a guy won't die for a ball and make an out because he there's a runner on and he wants to keep it to a single instead of a double. So that's a shortcoming, I think, but it's something we can certainly seek to improve. Uh, yeah. Question. Um, Two yeah. Um, and that's not really an athleticism issue, but something else. I'm thinking that that was another idea. I think it's to look at that part of the skill of being out here. Yep. So that's interesting. So, something I don't want to get too off topic here, but our video scouts also um, they tag like 
defensive misplays, which are like not quite errors, but they have consequences like losing an out. So let's say two outfielders are going at the same ball and like one of them made a defensive misplay because he cut the other guy off and they both lose the out. If one of those fielders, the one that made the defensive misplay, the, the communication error, he actually gets all of the penalty instead of the guy who got trucked into. So we, we try our best to, but as you said, like there are things that like we can't always quantify. Um, kind of like a computer vision kind of thing. Yeah. So we're, we're actually experimenting with that, um, at the major league level. Um, I think if that goes well, we can do it at the minor league level. Um, cause I don't know if it's obvious, but like charting in the outfield is pretty hard because it's so vast and you know, the infield, you can kind of relate people to the base that they're near, uh, which you can't really do in the outfield. So it's a little more subject to error, but like, we're hoping that something like computer vision and something more automated can kind of help that operation. I think I have time for one more question. So in her part, like if he's positioned for whatever ball, because he thinks that ball is going to hit close to the left field line. Right. And it doesn't because the pitcher threw the wrong pitch. That's like kind of what you're getting at. If he's positioned out of place, he won't get dinged. That's like a positioning ding. And like if he's positioned far away from where the ball is, it's going to lower his like accountability out rate. So in theory, in a situation like that, he should not get penalized as long as like he's actually far from where the ball does end up going. I think we're out of time, Scott. Okay. Thanks everybody. <laughs>